Hello, and welcome to Guy Aitchison's Reinventing the Tattoo Community, and thank you for tuning in today. You're currently watching the Skill Building Sunday Drawing Group, hosted by me, Jason Leeser. Today is May 29th. It's 1 p.m., um, and I'll be your host for today. If this is working for you, please let us know in the comments and in the chat area, and um, let's get going. Uh, Guy Aitchison's Reinventing the Tattoo Community is where tattooers, apprentices, collectors, and the curious are encouraged to join in these live streams, real world events, to share and inspire and ultimately create better art and tattoos together. We beam out nearly every day and with your help have evolved into a quality network of amazing live and on-demand tattoo and art shows that have all been receiving rave reviews. You can find us on both the app stores, the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, or maybe you're beaming in live from YouTube or Facebook, or maybe you're catching the replays on the Roku channel, uh, reinventingthetattoo.com slash Roku, or maybe you're listening to the podcast in some of the usual places such as Apple or Spotify. Uh, but you can always get the latest event schedule and notifications so you don't miss your favorite shows. Um, or at, uh, you can access all of that at reinventingthetattoo.com. Uh, sorry, last minute edits to the opening. Uh, it happens every now and then. Reinventingthetattoo.com links out to everywhere. If you like this kind of show, if you like talking about tattoos and artwork, if you have questions, recommend us to your friends. Um, tell everyone that you know, come join us. Join the discussions. Don't be afraid to jump in on the Zoom. Uh, we're always looking for new people with new perspectives, new ideas, and new opinions to join us on these shows. Uh, we have a couple of weekly staple shows we always encourage people to tune into starting on Sundays at 1 p.m. with me, Jason Leeser, for the Skill Building Sunday Drawing Group. This is followed on Mondays at 9 a.m. with Drawing for Tattooers with James Wisdom where we discuss basic drawing techniques and strategies. That's followed on Mondays at 11 a.m. with the Tattoo Weekly, hosted by Gabe Ripley, Jake Meeks, and Lauren Gregory. Mondays at 9 p.m., we have a subscriber's exclusive drawing group with Guy Aitchison himself, where we cover different sections of the Reinventing the Tattoo Canon live with Guy in a private Zoom session. It's actually really awesome. And that is included if you do subscribe to the Canon, uh, you do have access to those Monday night drawing groups. Take advantage of them. They're going to be helpful. I guarantee it. Uh, Tuesdays at 10 a.m., we have another live drawing group with a very good friend of mine and incredibly talented tattoo artist, Ricardo Certivant, uh, where we discuss philosophy and life, different challenges that we face in everyday life being a tattooer, uh, drawing strategies, live painting techniques and all types of other fun art stuff. Wednesdays at noon, we have the Tattoo Now show with Gabe Ripley, where we discuss a lot more of the business back end of being a tattoo artist, um, where we discuss business strategies, marketing, uh, client satisfaction is a pretty common topic. These are all important things in the life of a tattoo artist. Thursdays at six, we have the Tattoo Collecting Podcast with Fawn Baker and Jordan Ruckus, uh, where different people that have collected tattoos from many artists around the world can come in and share some of their stories about collecting tattoos from different artists. We have a number, a number of upcoming special events and live convention coverage that we always ask that you tune into or join us at in person if you feel comfortable with that. June 3rd through 5th, which is next weekend, I will be up at the Deadly Tattoo Convention in Calgary, Canada, the Gray Eagle Convention Center. This is hosted by James Tex of Deadly Tattoos. Uh, the entire Deadly Tattoo crew will be there, including Chris Dunn and Anthony Tex. Other special guest artists will be Teresa Sharp, Steve Moore, um, Curtis Burgess, and a number of other absolutely incredible caliber of artists that will be there. So I'm going to be going through and doing as many interviews with as many people as I can. June 10th through 12th, we have the Ink Mania Tattoo Convention with Phil Holt and Stefano will both be in person. Guy will be beaming in 
Um, Frank Lenatra and a few other amazing artists will also be doing live seminars. We will have a Reinventing the Tattoo booth, cameras, and we'll probably be doing interviews. So please stop by and say hi. July 29th through 31st, 2022, we have the Rubber City Tattoo Invitational in Akron, Ohio with Tony Urbanic. The end of August, we will be in Hell City at the Phoenix, uh, Hell City Phoenix Tattoo Convention. October 21st through 23rd, we have the Richmond Tattoo Arts Festival. Um, that's another great, great show that we always encourage people to come out to. We'd like to go through and take a second to thank some of our sponsors and the people that make this happen. Starting off with Raw Pigments, an ink company that's tapping into the source, rawpigments.co. They are 100% vegan friendly and acrylic free. They're made from natural organic pigments. You cannot go wrong with Raw Pigments. I've started to incorporate a lot of those into my own personal lineup and they saturate the skin great. They're completely light fast. So you know those pigments over time aren't gonna fade quite as much as you know, a few other brands. They're absolutely incredible. I highly recommend everyone take a shot at them. They're absolutely awesome. Next, we have worldtattooevents.com, the largest, most comprehensive resource for tattoo events worldwide. They're constantly updating everything because certain conventions and events are still getting rescheduled like crazy. So if you want to stay up to date with the latest and greatest news for tattoo conventions around the world, take a look at worldtattooevents.com. Next, we have DLIES Pro, also known as Dermalize in the rest of the world. Uh, thank you, international copyright laws. Protect your art. If you're still using saran wrap to wrap your tattoos, maybe it's time to upgrade. Um, this stuff was designed by wound care specialists. It's absolutely phenomenal. Highly recommend it. I've used it several times myself with great results. Uh, take a look, Google it, find out what it's about. It's definitely one way to help step up your aftercare game. Next, we have Tattoo Now, technology for tattooers. The leading edge in SEO and professional development for tattooers of all levels. They're now accepting new clients. If you're really trying to figure out a way to target the clientele that you really want to tattoo, take a look at tattoonow.com. This is the way that you can go through and you can really start attracting those clients that you really want to tattoo, your target audience. Take a look at tattoonow.com. They also have a full list of incredible live seminars that you can download and watch. Um, including Bob Tyrell's seminar on black and gray horror portraits. BJ Betts has a three-hour lettering seminar. Uh, and there's tons of other live on-demand tattoo seminars that you can watch. As always, we would like to go through and thank Guy Aitchison, the founder and inspiration behind Reinventing the Tattoo. Go to GuyAitchison.com, where you can pick up a copy of his Biomech Encyclopedia his DVDs, some custom tattoo coil machines. Pretty awesome for those of you that uh, collect coil machines. Um, he also has some original oil paintings for sale and prints and countless other stuff. Uh, he's constantly posting new stuff all the time. It's amazing. So take a look at guyhson.com. Would like to go through and take a minute to thank two of our affiliates, The Apprenticeship Diaries with Amy Nichols, if you're just starting to get into the tattoo game and you're wondering what a good apprenticeship is going to be like or what to expect in an apprenticeship, take a look at the apprenticeship diaries. Amy Nichols dives into the nitty gritty behind tattoo apprenticeships, what to expect, what makes for a good apprenticeship, what makes for a not so good apprenticeship, warning signs to look out for in a not so good apprenticeship. These are all things that she covers and she does an incredible job with it. Would also like to say hi to Fireside Tattoo Network with Jake Meeks, another one of our affiliates. If you're already a tattoo artist and you're looking to really step your game up, take a look at the Fireside Tattoo Network on YouTube or the podcast. Go through, take a look. He has interviews with incredible artists from around the world, discussing strategies, discussing uh, different types of art techniques, and how some of these world-renowned tattooers 
really do what they do at the level at which they perform. So if you're really looking for a way to kind of step some things up, take a look at the Fireside Tattoo Network. We always ask that if you like the show, please, please, please go through, post a positive review on our channel, hit those like and subscribe buttons, help get the word out, uh, recommend it out to other colleagues, people that you may work with. Maybe you can live stream it at the studio you're at. Who knows? Um, but we always like to ask that people really help us to get the word out about these shows so that we can continue to provide this kind of content for you. If you would like to host a Reinventing the Tattoo event, or maybe you want to become a sponsor in the community, or maybe you're looking for a tattoo critique, you can always get information on anything related to Reinventing the Tattoo at management at reinventingthetattoo.com. Send us an email and we'll be happy to get right back to you. So welcome to the show. Uh, we've got a pretty awesome time lined up for you today. We've got special guest uh, with us, Seth Mushrush, who will be tattooing live. So it should be a pretty awesome time. Um, and I'm going to be working on a commission painting, the same one I was working on last week. So yeah, definitely uh, hop in. If anyone would like the uh, Zoom link to join us live in the Zoom chat um, or participate and ask us questions, you are more than welcome to. Send me a message, let me know, uh, you know, make a comment or some way that I can reach out to you to send you that Zoom link because I can't post it publicly. We've made that mistake before and it did not go so well. So we always ask, send us a message, drop us a comment, let me know how I can get in touch with you and I will be more than happy to send you the link to join us live. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna switch cameras and I'm gonna get started on painting. And Seth, um, feel free to unmute and turn your video on whenever you get the chance. I know you're in the middle of a tattoo right now. So if we can't get to you right away, I totally understand. Um. It's not let me do the video here. What? It says uh, you've disabled my video. Oh wait, there we go. Yeah, it's saying it's disabled. I just sent you the 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 uh, host. Start your video. Okay. Start video. There it is. Yeah, there you are. What's going on? Look at that handsome face. Look at that. <laughs> my face mullet on the bottom. Uh, all right, and I'm going to switch cameras. There we go, much better. And have, this we can stop and exit. I have a no call, no show right now for my first one. Ooh, no, just a little, bueno. little, uh, little handwriting, so it's not that big of a deal. And then uh, the other three ladies that are coming in are getting, um, they were supposed to get this little Deathly Hallow symbols and decided to go with. Um, so I just talked to her on the phone. They switched it up this morning. They said, made an executive decision and decided they were going to do little minimalist tattoos. So well, take care know, of Sometimes these things happen. You know, no problem. to me, no problem. a tattoo is a tattoo. There's always knowledge to be gained from it and practice that you can, you can go through and you can utilize with it, you know, whether sure. practicing outlining or, um, you just, know, sometimes those minimalist ones can be pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you for a Sunday on a Memorial Day weekend, when I'm going to be driving back to Philly after this, I'm uh, I'm more than happy to accommodate a, a lesser complicated tattoo, you know, for sure. Oh, and absolutely. always try to, uh, that's the advice I, I give everybody that I possibly can. That's, you know, new to tattooing or anything like that is always try to make the most out of every opportunity with tattooing. Like, you know, whether it's a, you know, um, minimalist, uh, you know, infinity symbol or whatever it is, you know, see, see if you can flex whatever, you know, ideas and skills you have with it and, you know, make it unique. Right. Absolutely. Along with it. And if not, just do a good job. That's what we're paid to do. So, yeah. So I did actually come into this show today with a topic I would like to discuss, and it's a topic you and I have talked at length about, um, and that is community, right? being yes. part of a larger tattoo community um, and how that can be insanely beneficial 
for the life and career of a tattoo artist. Yeah. Um, I always try to encourage people at all times, become involved, get out there, meet new people with different perspectives on things. Um, I know some people like to stay in their bubble and I'm not knocking that at all. If that's the way that you like to be more power to you. Um, But I personally think that you might be doing yourself a disservice by staying inside a smaller bubble. When you really get out there and you really start to explore the community as a whole, and you really start to take a step back and say, you know what, there's different people out there with different ways of doing things, different ideas and different opinions. And if I want to operate on the level that some of these other people are operating on, you know, like Teresa Sharp or James Tex or Steve Moore, um, these guys are all very active in a community as a whole. And they're more than happy to talk to people, you know, should you ask them questions, but if you never get out there and ask them questions, how are you really going to know? Yeah. Right. Uh, It's a funny thing about bubbles. Are they pop? Yes. Right. And uh, if, if you don't have a good community around you, um, you're not going to find anybody, anybody that's going to be there willing to catch you, you know, if you're having an issue with something or you need to, to bounce ideas off people. And also it's a finite amount of space, right? I mean, you, I think it's so important to be able to, and we, we talk about this all the time is being able to accept knowledge and experience, no matter where it's coming from or who it's coming from, you know? And, and if you close yourself off to the rest of the world and you close yourself off to the rest of the tattoo community and live inside of your own ego, you're never gonna grow. You're only gonna get as big as whatever, whatever you're allowing yourself to, I think. And it's important to be able to um, talk to people and share ideas. People are willing to, uh, you, there's a reason why all of those people that you named, you know, why they're so wildly successful and, um, a large part of that is they stay in touch. You know, they talk to other people. I mean, you can, you can be accomplished, you can be technically proficient. Um, but if you're not willing to share any of that experience with other people and have them share theirs with you, you're only going to go so far. You know? Yeah. You're shooting can. yourself in the foot. Uh, yeah. A hundred percent. Um, it looks like my client, let me see here. Is um by the way, I would like to take a second to uh to plug something real quick. Um I would like to take a second to thank Forrest over at Tattoo Smart. Um, I had a pretty nice long meeting with him today about the new community being launched. It's not quite publicly available just yet. Um, Very select people have been given the invitations to join this um, vetted tattoo artist community. Any people out there that might remember what the Reed Street Forum was? Well, guess what? This is going to be exactly like that in a lot of different ways with a lot of very high caliber artists coming in and being willing to contribute their information and their knowledge to the tattoo community as a whole. So if you're looking, if you are a veteran tattooer, if you were, maybe you were part of the old Reed street forum, who knows? Um, Good old days. I I was not that fortunate to become a part of it uh, because that was just dying off as I was kind of coming into the industry. Um. So it's, it, it kind of started to peter out right around the time that I was really starting to get involved with some things. And so I kind of missed the boat on it. And I was really disappointed about that because I heard so many great things. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of the way that things go sometimes. Um, but I'm very excited to be a part of this new community. And it is looking like it's going to be absolutely incredible. Yeah. We have uh, Gerardo just dropped a comment in the, uh, the YouTube. 
saying good day, everyone. What's up, Gerardo? Going on, brother. Uh, Gerardo is a fellow reinventing the tattoo member. Um, who I see quite regularly on some of the drawing exercises and Monday night sessions. Nice. So big shout out to him. And I'm still working on the same commission I was working on last week. Oh, let us see. I will be happy to Let me switch this around. There we go. I'll oh yeah, up there in the corner. So as I finished up all of the uh, the filigree and all of the uh, scroll designs, got most of my black outlines down. Started filling in some of the color. I'm probably going to go back through and tweak some of the contrast in the rows and just make it just a hair darker, so it's a little bit more obvious. Although yeah. I do kind of like it being a little bit more subtle. But I also need to add more of a black contrast to the uh, midpoint shadow. Where this white line in the middle is, I'm going to go back through at the end of it and take a bit of pure bright white, um, go right across that, and then sweep that up so that that gives it that nice glare, that nice okay. kind of um, lighting glare off of glass. Sure. Um, and then I'm going to go back through, but I always do my pure bright, brightest whites last. So I'll be adding a couple of little bright white, you know, uh, you know, highlights to like some of the beads. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to add any white to the actual um, scroll design, though. I think I'm going to leave that just the way it is. But today, if all goes well, I'll be layering in color on the flames at the top. And I may I, I don't know if I'm going to have time, but I may start doing some of the uh, drop shadow coming out from behind everything. Awesome. Yeah, it looks good, man. That looks really good. I agree with you not doing white in the uh, in the scroll work, kind of letting that recede a little bit. Yeah. I think the beads are going to need it. Absolutely. But I think everything else can do without it. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. And I'd be careful, too, like with the um, when you're dropping the, the white over the top of everything there, um, as it gets is that line, that highlight line. Um, comes closer to both edges of the heart like maybe like shade in off of that a little bit so it's not pure white all the way out to the edge because that'll flatten it if you want it to look like it's kind of rounding out like that bubbling out you want that the white you stuff. just want your bright bright yeah. white right in the middle and then that's going to fade out towards fade the out. Side. Yes. absolutely yeah yeah killer i like those flames too man that's i love those like ornamental style flames are so badass well, I'm going for a little bit of a different kind of look for the flames. I'm going to go with more of a flat, almost traditional kind of look. Okay. Um, just to kind of contrast a lot of the, the modeling and a lot of the um, dimension that I have in other parts of this painting. Sure. You know, trying to do like a menagerie of different styles. Ooh, good word. That's a cool brush you're using there, man. What is that thing? Looks like this a menagerie. Yeah, look at that. Looks like the this uh, is um this is my space aged high tech um Esconda travel brush. It's like it's, something uh, it's County. a number six Esconda Prado. Crazy. Yeah, it comes apart too, so you can store it and travel with it without damaging the bristles. What? So that's hollow then. Is that metal on the end of it or is that just painted? Oh no, it's metal. Add it's it. a solid aluminum case. So it's got, um, I'll show you in just a second once I fan that out a little bit more. Very, very Judas Priest of you. It's, it's metal. It's definitely metal. Oh, it's metal, man. It's <laughs> like the deepest, you know, bowels of metal. None um, more. So this comes wow. off. So it becomes two pieces. Stick it right inside. Right. This goes right in there. And now you can travel with it. That is killer. I got to get one. That is they come in different sets. You can get different sizes. Mine came with a set of three. Um, I generally tend to lean more towards smaller brushes. Yeah. Um, and just like go to town on them. But I got this, uh, this three piece set. Um, I don't think it was very expensive. I think it was like 50 bucks, um, which for a good set of watercolor brushes, 
Yeah. That's actually really, really cheap. Um, I like them. They're, they're pretty absorbent, but it almost feels like the bristles are coated with almost like a waxy coating. Nice. And I don't know if that's because they are um, synthetic sable or if they are, you know, some type of a uh, different type of bristle. But um, they're, they, they're not always the most absorbent, so I tend to use them sparingly. Okay. Uh, they're nowhere near as absorbent as something like, you know, a natural squirrel hairbrush. Um, no, it's, uh, no, I did not harvest these uh, hairs myself. I bought this. I did not make this myself. So no squirrels that I know of personally were harmed in the making of this brush. Not oh. that I don't think squirrels are, you know, terrible creatures, but they might look cute, but they can do a lot of damage to a car if they get inside. <laughs> yeah. Squirrels. Yeah. Squirrels and chipmunks I can do without. Not my thing chipmunks can be such assholes when they run out in front of your car and they make you feel bad. I'm like, I, I, I try to avoid any, any contact with stuff like that. Uh, but I mean, you hear horror stories of people running off the road. <laughs> yeah. Trying, trying to avoid that kind of stuff. So you're using, um, what kind of black are you using for that? Like what kind of a uh, watercolor? Um, so this is, I picked up a bottle of Doc Martin's Ocean uh, Fountain Pen Ink, which is okay. a permanent, and I don't know if it's like alcohol based or what, but it's a permanent non-clogging black ink that actually thins out really well. Um, nice. When it dries, it is waterproof, Okay. which is something that I can't use anything that is not waterproof because I use a lot of very large washes when i paint sure. uh we did have kyle o olson uh say hey everyone looking rad jason thank you kyle what's up uh, kyle nunya nunya business uh said sorry i'm late jason um nunya that's no problem there's you can join whenever you want it's not a big deal yeah you don't have yeah it's not this isn't one of those things. I'm sorry, you didn't show up on time. Not not allowed. No, join whenever you want. Um, cool. So I've got the, the black tips kind of laid in. Um, I'm a big fan of Dr. P.H. Martin's uh, stuff. I've got like a full set of their radiant watercolors, which I almost never use anymore. Mostly just because they're not light fast. So whatever you paint, with Dr. PH Martin's radiant watercolors be per, if you don't if you don't scan it very shortly after you paint it you will start to notice a lot of those colors fading so be prepared um i switched over to using the Dr. PH Martin's hydrus and their spectrolite spectrolites their um I don't know if I have any of them out, but the Spectralite is like their liquid, their liquid acrylic. This is uh, the Hydrus that I, it's one of my go-to colors. It's brilliant cadmium red. Um, I wanted something a little bit more pink based for the heart. So I used Alizarin Crimson and Deep Red Rose uh, for the heart because I wanted a little bit more of that like pink undertone. So, but today I'm going to be using a little bit of my favorite color. Well, two favorite colors, brilliant cadmium red and permanent red. Permanent red's got a bit more of an orange base to it. It's got a little bit, as you can tell, just by looking at the label, it's a little bit more of an orange base. Um, I'm going to be mixing that up with some alizarin crimson, some uh, Hansa yellow medium, this weird color called gambage and uh, some chrome yellow. So I'm going crazy. Nice. Uh, Kyle Olson says, hey, Seth. What's up, bud? And we are joined today by Kyle. What's up, Kyle? Hey, what's up? How are you guys? Doing well, man. Doing well. 
All right, let's start laying color into this guy. What are you guys working on today? Uh, I have. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I have a. Uh, I just have a couple of clients coming in for small tattoos. Uh, girl who was coming in first, just getting some of her grandmother's handwriting, and then a couple uh, after that. Uh, three women are coming in to get some minimum minimalist style tattoos and landscape stuff. Um, and that's it. I'm heading back out on the road down to uh, Philly. Oh, nice. Hmm. Uh, what are you working on, man? Um, I don't know. I'm in between a lot of stuff. I haven't um, really started anything yet. <laughs> Got a bunch of things that are like 90% of the way there. So it's like just kind of jumping around. Nice. Yeah. Do that axe behind you. Yeah, it's my seventh stream. It's my baby yeah. right there. Yeah, it's nice. Ibanez. Yeah. 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 Recognize that stock anywhere. Of course. Yeah, I always find I'm always kind of hesitant sometimes to actually finish projects, as weird as that sounds, just because like I enjoy the process of making art so much. I don't ever want it to end. Maybe yeah. I'm weird. Yeah. And what do you do with them when they're finished, when they're not commissioned? You know, like how many paintings do we have of our own that are just laying up? Oh, I've got boxes yeah. filled with original art that not, either A, should never see the light of day because, <laughs> yeah. Um, or B, like, I just don't have frames for them. So they just keep piling up. Um, right. I did find a really good uh, framing place that makes really nice, fancy, fancy frames for not a whole lot of money. Um, big shout out to Laredo Frame Factory down in Laredo, Texas. They make incredible solid wood three-piece frames that are gallery ready. Like these look like actual gallery frames. They're amazing. Um, and they are very reasonably priced. Nice. You know, nice. for the quality that you get, I was like, wait, how much? That's it? It's like a $500 frame and you're selling it to me for hundred bucks? What? No, it's not that cheap, but it's... Um, You know, it's, oh. it's interesting. Uh, when, uh, when I was moving up here, um, I had to get rid of a lot of, uh, a lot of paintings that I had, you know, I had a lot of stuff that's on canvas that had, you know, these frames made for it and everything. And I, I just, I didn't know what I was going to do with them. And, you know, a couple of them I really liked and I kind of wanted to hang on to them, but I, um, I ended up giving them away to family and friends and man, that was, <laughs> in a way that was more fulfilling than selling them, you know, like it, yeah. it, their reaction to it. And um, the fact that I know that they'll enjoy it for a long time and it's going to a good home, you know, where it's going to be like, that's a, it's a pretty awesome feeling. I mean, it's great to sell something, but it's even better when, you know, you can just gift somebody that's not even expecting it, you know? Yeah. It, that's actually what I'm doing this painting for. Um, it's going to be hung up in a, a friend of mine just opened up a second studio and they've got some pretty bare walls in there and they're trying to only hang up original stuff. So they've got a whole bunch of original, like hand painted flash that's on the walls. Um, it's got a very traditional esque theme. So, but they only want to stick with original stuff. So it was like, all right, let me paint something for you that's original that's going to fit the theme of your studio. Yeah. You know, and the guy was like, absolutely, that would be awesome. Hey, so speaking of I bare did walls. just have someone, I had someone hit me up. It's uh, Adam Rodriguez from Monday Night Classes. Um, wanted to ask me about my flower process. Um, so I was going to go through and switch over to my iPad for a minute. Um, and I'll kind of show you guys what I came up with for last Monday's class. Let's unhook this. 
Oh, equipment changes. Gotta love it. Oh, yeah. Who doesn't love technology, right? When it works, it works great. But when it doesn't, it's crap. Yeah. All right, so... Wait for the sound. Oh. Unless I have the sound turned off on it, which I might. Yeah, I, uh, so last Monday night's class was a class on cover ups and cover up design. And um, very fascinating to see everyone's take on it. There we go. There's the sound. Uh, let's see, auto landscape. Um, and I'll kind of go through with everyone and kind of show how I got to where I am. So this is what we were working on covering up. Okay. And we had to come up with a design that we could go through and that would be effective. And the theme was flowers. Um, Flowers are usually my go-to. I love drawing flowers all the time. Like I will tattoo flowers all day long, every day, if I can. Uh, I came up with the idea, mums were a big thing, chrysanthemums. So I was like, okay, well, instead of going through and doing like a whole bunch of smaller flowers, I'm just going to do one big one, right? Because that's usually what I like to do. So I just kind of came up with this big chrysanthemum, started coloring it in and shading it in and all that stuff. And it should be pretty effective as far as a cover-up goes with enough darker shading on the interior. But I think Adam wanted to uh, go through some of my strategies on how I sketch them and draw them. And there's a couple of great ways to start sketching out flowers that I highly recommend. Um, and let's go into my, I'm just gonna create a new document. And then we'll switch this to like a medium gray. And that way you guys can see everything a little bit easier. Let's go over to a light blue sketching. Cool. So there's a couple of ways that I always recommend starting out with sketching flowers. Um, the first way is I always, always, always either start with an oval or a circle, right? So let's make this a little bigger and a little lighter. Hopefully everyone can see this all right. So if I'm gonna draw a mum, I'm gonna start out with a circle because they have a little bit more of a rounded shape. If I was gonna draw something like um, a rose or uh, a tulip or uh, an iris flower, um, anything along those lines, I would go with more of a, either a weird shaped like oval that's bigger at the top and smaller at the bottom or I would go through with just a standard oval and then build out from there. And by oval, I mean like a tall oval, not a wide one. From here, I always like to go through and do create my center line. So I know exactly where I want the opening of the mum to be, right? Because if you look, chrysanthemums almost always bloom from the middle. And if you wanna draw it at a three quarter perspective, which is one of the most interesting perspectives, you wanna make sure that you know where that middle is, uh, where the center part is. So if I were to draw a line going straight through the middle of this, it would be coming out right down here at the bottom because this would wrap around this way, that would wrap around this way. Just to give you an idea of like volume, right? So this would actually be, well, this would probably be over a little bit more. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's better. So I have my axis going straight through the flower and I have my arcing circles to determine where, you know, where that volume is gonna be. And I can keep all of that stuff up for now. All this stuff that's going to be in the background that's going to be hidden, I'm going to be erasing just to keep the design a bit more clear. Cool. 
So I've got a basic circle, rough circle, right? I'm not too worried about this circle because you're never going to see it after this. This is just for the layout. I'm going to make that a little bit dimmer. So now what I want to do, I already know my perspective and I want this flower to be blooming at an angle. So I'm going to rotate this around. We'll have the flower blooming out that way. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's basically just a guide. So I'm gonna come up here and let's switch over to a teal color. So there's two basic ways that you can go through and draw a chrysanthemum from here. First way on an iPad is to go through with something like um, a hard airbrush. And I already have one set up. Uh, hard brush, set that up so that it's very, very low opacity, right? And it's, it, the amount of taper isn't really going to matter too much. Um, but you don't want it to be super huge and you don't want it to be super small. You want it to be kind of in the middle. And I always recommend doing this on a second layer, always. That way you don't mess up your guidelines. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by just drawing a very quick circle. And as you can tell, I've got pressure sensitivity turned way up. So I have to remember to keep it a little bit lighter. Just to create that rim that edge so I know where I want that first outer layer of petals to fall. When I say outer, I'm starting here at the middle. I'm starting here right at the middle and I'm working my way out from the center. So I'm gonna go through and create that first outer layer because this inner layer up here where I have my circle that I drew before about where I want that mum to open that's where I'm going to start to see a lot of the petals curling over, right, in the middle, and you're only going to see parts of them. So I've got my first layer on the outer side. That's going to be closest to the middle without being in the middle. Um, so from here, once again, with a very, very low opacity hard airbrush, you can start. I always like to start either by the inside and then build out, or you can start on the outside with hard pressure and then build in. And then you just do that a whole bunch of times in different areas in different ways. You know, giving some a little bit more of a hook, um, coming through. And it takes a little bit to get used to doing it this way. It really does. I always like to find one spot, usually right around the center point of this blue line to go through and start moving my petals in a different direction. So maybe I'll bring this one out and over. And it's gonna be kind of hard to see right now, but it is happening. And you'll start to see these levels and layers developing. And you'll start to see you know, the form really coming to life just by bringing these all back to that same midpoint. Um, and by midpoint, I mean all of these petals, these outer petals that I'm drawing are all going to start right about here. Okay, so I'm constantly bringing all of these teal petals back to that same point of origin. Because even though we can't see it, that origin point for these petals is actually hidden about here, okay? But because of perspective and different elements blocking things out, um, it's right, it's, you're not gonna be able to see where they start from, but you will be able to see that they almost always come out from a standardized centralized point. So this is just one basic method. Um, and we can make these as crazy as we want. And I can't really take credit for this method, by the way. This was all taught on a Tattoo Smart seminar on chrysanthemums um, that I tuned into. And I believe it's still available on the Tattoo Smart channel. But definitely go through and take a look at that because I learned a lot of little tricks from that. Uh, I just want to say how 
really cool and streamlining the process it is when you use those uh, thicker brushes like that to lay in those petals. I mean, you know, I, I, you draw them by hand with pencil and it's like single line, single line. It's just, this is one of those situations where, boy, does it just make everything easier. Yeah. Well, so this is one method. And then from here, you can go through, you can trace those outer lines, make them fold over wherever you want. The next method I'm going to show you is one that I actually recommend for more like neotrad mums. Um, if you like to give them a little bit more of like a unique kind of look. So I would use this method for more traditional style chrysanthemums. I would, because you're maintaining a lot of consistency and size for each petal. You're not really developing a whole lot of sharp angles. There's a lot more smooth flowing curves in it, which is more typical of a traditional style chrysanthemum. If I was going to go through and I was going to draw something a bit more neotrad, um, which is the way that I usually like to draw mums, I'm going to go over that right now. So we'll still start out with that same circle, but instead of using the big airbrush, I'm going to keep my sketching brush and I'm going to go through and I'm going to start drawing ovals, smaller ovals around this mum in random spots and random angles in random ways. Um, I guess if, if you really look at it, you could see like a downward kind of angle starting here and moving around on in either direction. Um, but you'll start to notice them slowly curve around. Draw one there, one there. Here's another one. Um, we'll do one here. And then we'll do one that's kind of like in between these two. Then I'm going to flip it around and we'll do one pointing down. This guy will be pointing down. We'll do another one pointing down over here. We'll do one pointing down here. And we'll do another guy here, here. We'll do one here and say here, here, and here. Maybe here. Yeah, that looks good. These are just kind of arbitrary. I'm just kind of not really caring where they land um, because that's going to give it a lot more of a natural randomized pattern. So once I have those ovals drawn in, I'm going to find the length of that oval, draw my center line, and then once again, bringing that right back here to this midpoint. So I'm going to start connecting them all with just a single line. Not really caring if I draw over top of the ovals or anything like that. Uh, this one, I'm going to curve a little bit more. It's going to be a little bit more of a straight line. This guy is going to be a little bit more of like a curled in petal. This one's going to be a little bit more round. And if you'll notice, I always try to overlap the oval just a hair because that's gonna make the one of the next parts a lot easier. This guy will bring in and down. And you can already start to see some of the structure uh, coming to life. And you can really start to see how these different petals are gonna be flowing. Uh, this one will start here, no. No, I want that one. This one's going to wrap a little bit more, be in a different direction. I always like to do that with at least two petals. Um, and I'll probably do one of those there and then one of them over here, maybe. Where they like head in a completely different direction. Because if you really look at the way spider mums petals fall, they really are very random. Maybe we'll do another guy here. But that's having randomized kind of um, random pattern petals 
really is a lot more of a natural look because it's nature. It's not set in any, while yes, there are certain structures with certain flowers and certain areas that create a naturalized pattern. When you look at the edge patterns of different petals, they can be really, really weird and random. Look at uh, edges of peonies, right? Those don't fall into a naturalized pattern. Those are completely random. So it gives it more of a unique, organic kind of look. This guy's going to curl over a little bit. This one, we'll put the tip there and just bring that in. Uh, this one, we'll do the same thing. This guy will have curling over a little bit more. And you'll kind of see how based on the size of the ovals that I draw, it's going to give the tops of these petals a little bit more of a flare, uh, which is exactly what I wanted to go for. This one, I'm actually going to change the angle of this oval a little bit more just to balance it out. Okay, so now, now this just looks like a big scribbly mess, right? But this is where all the magic happens. Create a new layer. Make this a little smaller. What I'm gonna start to do now is everywhere where I oval, overlapped that oval, that's gonna start to be a point. So that's gonna curl in. This one's gonna curl in. This is gonna curl in. This is gonna curl in, same thing here, same thing here. These are gonna be the tips of our mum petals. Once again, this is for more of like a neo-traditional style uh, chrysanthemum. And every artist out there through drawing them left and right, up and down and trying to figure them out for yourself, you're gonna develop your own techniques and you're gonna develop your own tricks that are gonna help you make mums in your own way. This is just one of the ways that I've found that can be helpful and useful. So I'll start out marking this, right, on most of them. And that one will do this way. This one will go this way. Once again, I'm not really worried about if these are perfect. I'm just kind of like scribbling them in real quick. Here's the fun part, right? Here's where you really start to see the structure. You're going to start to notice how a lot of these petals are overlapping with where those ovals are sitting. So any of them that are coming towards me more, that are a lot more in the front, I'm going to follow this line down and around. This is going to be my center line, my spine line. Now where this oval is, I'm going to bulge it out a little bit, almost like following the shape of that oval. Then I'm just going to bring it in a little bit. And there's my outer part of the petal. This part, once again, I'm going to bring it down, give it a little bit of a bulge. And now I've just created that part of the petal. Okay. Again, I'm going to bring that down with a big loop, small loop, small loop. This is going to be my center line. And now I'm going to come down and just bring that down and around, maybe one bump. Sometimes for these outer lines, sometimes you don't really have to go through and give them any kind of a bump. Sometimes it's just better to bring them around nice and smooth. Hey, uh, Jason. Yeah. Um, my uh, client, I just finished up with her small tattoo. She was here a few weeks ago to go and uh got a um i did some uh, black and gray piece on her forearm uh, like portrait style half tiger face half of her own face um and it's all healed up actually how long has it been Only yeah let's weeks. take a look at that man about, about three weeks old three or four weeks so um all right let me uh flip the camera around here all right oh wow nice Dude, look at the texture in that fur yeah that's beautiful Thank you. Yeah, I was excited with how it healed up. So it's good. I'm going to get some Absolutely, pictures of it. Absolutely, man. Awesome. Thank you. Bravo, dude. Bravo. Sorry to interrupt the uh, flower session there. 
Hey, no worries, man. No worries. Thanks, guys. So whichever direction, whichever side you want these pedals to be on, um, I would just take this outer line and just bring it around nice and smooth. Going to bring that down and over and around. And you just kind of fill it in as you go. Where you start to see more of the interior of the chrysanthemum petals, right? Just bring one smooth line around and then you just start adding a little bit more to the inside. And that's really going to give it that interior petal look, right? That's going to give you the inside of the petal with an outer fold over here on the far side and an outer fold over here on this side. Now, if you really want to start to get wacky with chrysanthemum petals, you can start adding in more jagged lines. For example, bringing this down and trying to draw every line almost as if it's an S curve. So from there, I would bring that around and then I would swoop that in with an S, bring that in and around. And then maybe curl this in and then swoop that in and around. So you can really get kind of funky with it and really make them look different and unique. Um, I still always like to keep these interior petals just kind of bumpy. Uh, then if you get stuck in a situation like this where you're like, well, okay, if this is my center line, and it's at that perspective, I know I'm gonna see part of this pedal here. I know I'm gonna see part of that on the other side, right? So what you can do is you can just draw a little bit of an oval and this would actually be the interior portion of the pedal. Okay, and you would still have your little hook at the front and then boom, there's part of it. Um, if you wanted to get even more funky, sometimes you can bring like a little, little bump back, but then you see how that changes the direction because this pedal is now heading back in this direction. Whereas if I add something like this, it's now moving in this direction, right? Just simply based on the perspective of where this back portion is. Right, so that's something to constantly keep in mind. Yeah, it's amazing how just adding or subtracting a little thing like that can make a world of difference in the way that an entire pedal moves. Um, sometimes I like to go through and give them a little bit of a, an even more weird look. And I'll bring this up and out almost like a diamond head. You know, that can be a way to draw the, the edges of them. Some people like to go with more of a diamond look for the whole initial petal structure. What that would look like is here. You would bring that out on either side and then you would kind of curve that down. That's gonna give you a very big, broad tipped pedal. You know, and you can get really, really weird with it. And it's still gonna look like a chrysanthemum just based on how many petals there are coming out from where. Um, for some of these fold over ones, I like to get really weird with it. You know, maybe I'll come up here and then I'll I'll give this more of a hard angle and then I'll smooth it out. Um, sometimes I like to go through and just give these almost like little wing structures, really bring them back a little bit further. And then I'll just add like a little bit of a hint of the other side of the pedal to create that downward motion and to really set this part as being further back. So that's another pedal. Um, another way that you can do a little bit more of a traditional pedal, but not quite traditional, more neo-traditional, but with still a lot of very traditional aspects 
is to just work on the spine of these petals, keeping this top portion very rounded and very smooth. And then just doing like tiny little bumps and then like almost a squiggly line, right? Because if you look at real interior chrysanthemum petals, they're not perfectly smooth arcs and curves. You can bring this down and then here's another just like squiggly line. Um, sometimes you'll see a bit more of a smooth line that just kind of like weaves in and out. That's another way to do it. Sometimes you'll see the back spines of these mums with like little points on them. You know, if you wanted to give it more of an angular kind of look, but if you're going to do that, I would bring this top petal all the way back and then curve it back around. Because if you're going to have a, a sharp bend here, then you want that to be reflected in this surface of the petal as well. Not that, you know, I spent a lot of time drawing chrysanthemums or anything. That's just a few hours. I might have filled up two or three sketchbooks filled with them, just trying to figure them out. Um, but that's also what allows me to go through and sketch them and draw them so quickly. For the interior of the mum, that's the easy part. Start out with just like a couple of arcs, a couple of lines, following the form of this sphere. And then this part's as easy as giving it a little hook at the top, bringing it back down, and then giving it like a little bit of a bump. Same thing here. I'm going to give it a little bit of a, a point or a spike, giving it a little bit of a bump, and then curling that around. But the closer it gets to this center line that we drew in the first time, the closer it gets to this, the more symmetrical it's going to look because we're going to be able to see more of um, the other side of that interior petal as well. Oh, dude, it's no problem. Uh, Nunya Business said, uh, thanks so much. I didn't mean to pull you off what you were doing. Dude, it's fine. This is what I'm here for. I'm here to answer questions and help people out. Like I can paint later tonight. That's not a big deal. Um, that painting ain't going anywhere. That thing is under lock and key in a safe away from sunlight. No, I'm just joking. It's right here. Um, so I can just pull that over when we, whenever we get done. I'd rather take the time to help you out with something than you know, work on my own little side projects. So that's why I'm here. Um, but as I mentioned, these interior petals, you're going to start to see more of this other side as it moves around. You know, if I had one here, I'd probably see a good portion of both sides of the petal. If I had one here, I would start to see less of this outer portion. You know? Here, I would see almost none of it. So I would probably just stick with something like that. Here, same thing. So now we've got our interior petals. Where these back petals that are further, furthest away from you, but you know they're still curling in, right? Maybe we'll do one there and one there. These are very easy to lay out just by doing a couple of ovals, right? With a couple of curling center lines. And then these are like the easiest part of the whole thing. You can just take these, give that a little hook and then spread it out. Curl it over at the top and there's your interior petal. Give this a little hook. Spread it out, curve the back. There's an interior petal. Hook, curve, curve, interior petal. Now it does take some time and some practice, but once you get these basics down, it's like the easiest thing in the world. Um, 
it takes something that's very complex to draw. And just looking at the different ways that you can draw petals, you know, from, you know, very, very simplistic and very traditional to very neo-traditional and very kind of wacky. Um, there's all types of different ways that you can draw these to achieve a specific type of feeling or effect. Now, this inner ring here that we drew in the first place, this is basically just going to get the same kind of uh, treatment as that outer layer. Maybe I won't give these quite as much of a, a hook because these are still budding petals. They're just little baby petals. In the middle, I, I've got like a, a way that I really like to draw the middle of mums, even though it doesn't technically make sense because a lot of these petals will continue in different rings getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I'm not a big fan of that, mostly just because it makes the design a little too busy. Um, I like to simplify things a little bit more. Uh, so what I will do is I'll go through with like a small circle brush. I'll just do like a ring of circles. And, and then I'll just draw like some lines radiating out from it. Now, if you look at the middle of a chrysanthemum, this is not what it's going to look like. But it's one of the ways I found to simplify the interior, make it look complete without really getting super crazy with it. So that's, that's just one of many, that's one of many strategies for drawing chrysanthemums. It looks so good, man. Very cool. Good, and it's just a sketch. Thanks for sharing it. Man. Yeah, yeah, seriously. I, thank you. Yeah. If anyone ever has any questions or they want me to go over it a little bit slower again, let me know. Uh, but I'll do that offline. There's a couple of different ways you can get these uh, petals on the outside to curl in different ways. And I'll just touch on that real quick. But um, think of these. Think of all of the petals out there as just like big swirling ovals, right? Or like tubes. Yeah, I was struggling to do um, a flower for that for the same Monday exercise. And a lot of them just ended up real tubular. Right. Well, that's when you start thinking of them as just like, either curling flat planes that are rounded or curling tubes, it's, it, it makes things so simple because now you're looking at it and saying, oh yeah, if I do this and this, this would come in here. And now all you're doing is just adding another dimension. Right. right? So you can have them like spiraling out that way. That's a fun one. Um, you can have them spiraling the other way, depending on where this crossover lands, you can actually have it spiraling a different way. Um, if you cross this over like this, right, you can make this the interior by adding something like that, bring your spine line down on the outside and now it looks like it's wrapping around in the exact opposite direction, right? Because a lot of this stuff in here wouldn't be there. This would come down and around. This would end up on the inside. And now it's like flipped around, right? So you can really get crazy with it once you understand that it all it really is is just uh, a curved two-dimensional plane or a, an oval, a very stretched out oval. Once you understand that, you can have them curling and moving in different ways in different directions. Um, it just, it, it's one way to think about it. 
so that they can just flow and move in any direction you want. That's why I love tattooing and drawing flowers. They can fit any spot in any area you can imagine. And Adam, you don't owe me anything, man. Don't even worry about it, dude. This is part of why I do these things. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. If you buy me a beer, I'm going to drink it. I'm not going to lie. But you don't have to. Just throwing that out there. You did offer, though, so I may take you up on that one day if we meet. But yeah, so that's a very easy way to draw mums. If we hide that, starting out with the same oval, we can draw peonies. Any chance you could draw dads since you've drawn the mums? Ooh, ba -dum -bum oh, boom boom. We'll be all here day. all week, folks. Shows at four and nine. Tip your waitresses. Try the meatloaf. You got dad jokes for days, Seth. Well, we can draw peonies too. Peonies are easy. They're basically just ovals. Oval. 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 Maybe we'll do an oval here. We'll do an oval here. One over here, one over here, and we'll do one final one here. Taking the same kind of concept that we just used for the mums, we're just gonna draw bigger center lines. So this is gonna be our center line for that pedal. This is gonna be our center line. These are all the interior ones, by the way. This will be the center line for that back one. Granted, yes, the pedal structure is a little bit different, but it's still fairly simplistic. Um, by default, and once again, this is for more of a neo-traditional kind of peony flower. This will wrap around a little bit, so that'll give that a little bit more dimension. Um, this guy is actually going to be facing us, so we're only going to see part of it. that smaller. So I always start out with like just bigger block blocked in areas, just defining the shapes of whatever petals I want. Um, I always like to give these like a little bow in the middle. And then I'll break these up into individual segments. So I've got two, two, this guy's gonna be fairly similar. So we'll maybe give this one a different curl in a different way. One, two, and then back in, curl, one, two, and then back in. Give that a little bit more of a sharp fold over. These, the outer petals that kind of curl in where you see a lot of the sharper points, we're just gonna bring this down because that's gonna be a continuation off of the top portion. And then one, two, one, two. Yeah, there was a website out there a long time ago. Uh, if anyone remembers Elliot Wells from uh, the UK and how be he became known as like the peony king for doing like all these different ways of drawing and doing peonies. Um, he actually for a very long time had a, um, a whole seminar that he did. It was like 13 videos on how he draws and tattoos peonies. Unfortunately, the website is no longer available. They shut it down after a while. Um, I'm not saying that I don't have copies of those videos, 
But if I did, I would reach out to, or if I didn't, and I was still searching for them, uh, you could work out, try to shoot an email to Ink Workshops. Um, they might still have their emails up. I don't know. But they used to do some of the best video tutorials I've ever seen. Hanya masks, dragons, koi fish, um, flowers. They had Elliot Wells do the flower one. That was incredible. Um, you know, but they were all recorded in like 4K, uh, super HD resolution with like great walkthroughs, PDF downloads. They were pretty epic. But you can already start to see like the peony forming here, right? So it's all just ovals. And then where those ovals lay in. So I don't know. That's my two cents on it. So I hope that answers your question, Adam. Um, if you have any other questions, hit me up, let me know, and we can discuss that offline. Uh, I'm going to try to get a little bit more of this painting done. So, but yeah, if you guys want me to go over anything else on the iPad, let me know. I'll be happy to. Uh, and now I put this here. This goes back into here. Oh, wires. So much fun. Oh, you are the bane of my existence. Yeah, I've got a whole mess of wires behind my computer. I've just been putting off trying to wrangle them all together <laughs> oh dude i've got a whole rat's nest of like cables and cords and connectors and wires yeah uh, <laughs> power cables and extension cords it's pretty bad i'm not gonna lie it's it's really really bad sometimes yeah they're hard to to really keep track of yeah but you know and I mean, I was looking into uh, picking up some wireless HDMI uh, receivers and broadcasters, but um, they're really expensive, and oh, I don't sure. know that I'm going to invest that much into it. Right, right. I mean, maybe I will. Who knows? I'm not opposed to the idea, but... Are the, are the connections just as good with them? Uh, yeah, some have insane ranges, like 800 feet. Oh, shit. Sure. Okay. Yeah, like broadcasting and receiving 4k video from 800 feet away hmm. yeah not too crazy bad. but that's used for like movie and film recordings and live tv broadcasting right because those are insanely those are like a thousand dollars for one unit yeah and i would need at least three units and i'm not spending three thousand dollars <laughs> just so that I can transmit HDMI signal from like three feet away to three feet away. That's right. <laughs> that would be counterproductive. At least. Financially, that would be like suicide. That would not be good. Hey, Adam, I'm not the best, man. I'm just a tattooer trying to help other tattooers. Yep. Now I'm going to go through and start layering in a little bit of red into these flames. You want to see this magma rock I'm working on? Hell yeah, dude. Let me spotlight you. So... Okay. This, right, so this what you side got going on. This one's the picture. This one is mine. I like yours a bit more. Thank you. That's it's got really a lot cool. more like readable visual texture to it. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. 
from um, from a distance that like mine looks a bit um, duller, so I've just been trying to push the colors on that. Trying to a bit more to put, like, depth in there. I'd say really work on sharpening that detail right by your light source. Right, right. Because that's where you're going to see most of that really sharp contrast. You know, look at the stalagmites on the actual photo and then look at the stalagmites, those tiny little stalagmites on yours. And you'll start to notice how they're a little bit more out of focus. So, and your eye is immediately going to be drawn to those warm colors, those bright yellows. Right. That's where, you, just by the nature of color, that's where your eye gets drawn in a picture such as that, because it's the brightest spot and it's the warmest spot. Right. So right. right where you have those tiny little stalagmites, that's where your eye is going to be going to. So I would put very sharp edges on that very tiny little sharp edges because everyone's going to see that. And that's immediately what their eye is going to go to for the detail. And I would do them in red too. It looks like, like, you know, how guy does this stuff when it, whenever you get you a an little object, bit of that color coming blowing. around it. Mm. Yeah. And a wrap around the edge of the object. And uh, it, even just looking at the photo um, that you're working off of the reference, I can almost see red on, you know, Right, right. Warmest spot, you know, the, yeah, just at the tips there. So like exactly what Jason is saying, you know, refine them, bring them down to nice little sharp points and then just hit a little bit of a red on the outside edge there that'll kind of contrast with that that warm color behind it and look like it's wrapping around it. It looks great though, man. Thank you. Yeah, dude, great. definitely. Yeah, I've had these these pictures that I um, got of all these lava rocks that I found online sitting on my iPad for a couple of months, and I was like, yeah, I should probably do something with them at this point. Oh my Absolutely, man. Perfect. Oh my gosh. I mean, it, it, if you want my recommendation, dude, uh, take one of them and oh. start painting it. Do it by hand. Really get the feel of the way that those like nooks and crannies, you know, really move. Right. Oh, it sounds like Seth's uh, group of people got there. Thank you. Or maybe they, they just got done. Maybe both. Maybe both. Oh, that's so pretty. Oh, that wouldn't make much sense, though. So. No, no, I think they just got done getting tattooed. Because I, I thought I just heard someone say, oh, it's so pretty. Yeah, I think I heard that, too. That's the color. That's what I really want a little bit of red. Going right up into that black and just making it nice and soft. Just to give that that nice darker red tone. Because I like red in my things. So I don't care what other people think. I don't care what the rules are. I like red in my friends. Especially because I'm trying to flatten these out a little bit to give them more of like a traditional look. You put your red um, towards the tips. So I do, uh, for this, I'm going to be doing black, uh, which is what I did earlier. Black to red to orange to warm yellow to bright yellow. Okay, okay. To give it like a little bit of a reverse kind of look. Right. You know, a lot of people will start out with red and orange down at the bottom. But if you look at an actual flame, right, you're going to see some of the darker colors, a lot of the darker tones towards the tip. Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought about it too. Because it's like, that's, that's the source of it too. So it's a lot brighter down there. Right. Face. Although like, maybe I'm wrong, maybe maybe like that that's not the way flames work. Do you mind if I steal it the coffee? But this is no, the way I, did, I, I decided did a couple to paint it. Studies, so, you might be right. I mean, maybe. I mean, I, for all intents and purposes, I could be very, very wrong. I mean, I can't really. That's true. So I don't want it smaller for sure. But not that I really care because I've already started laying the red in. I would go more towards the front of your foot. It's a stylistic choice, if anything. Absolutely. And that's exactly what I'm going for, too, because I know this is going in a studio that has a very 1980s flash aesthetic, very traditionally based. 
So, so I wanted to make sure I stuck with something, like something that was very stu stylistically like similar. Down your right. You know, something that could go through and blend in with some of the other stuff that they have and complement the decor. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, I like that. That's a good attention to detail you've got. Yeah, it's, you know, it. whenever someone asks me for something that's going to be hung up in a public space, it's like, crap. <laughs> All right, let's see what I'm getting myself into. On display, I got to pull out all the tricks now. Don't get me wrong. I don't make custom paintings for everyone. Um, some people I would. Some people, it's like, eh, I don't really know you. Um, but I, I've known this guy for a while, and this is his second studio. His first studio is very well known um, in Philadelphia and the surrounding areas. Um, big shout out to Art Machine uh, Productions, Art Machine Tattoo uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Tim, you're my boy, my man. So yeah, big shout out to Art Machine. Um, they have been producing quality tattoos for a very, very long time. And um yeah, they they know what they're doing. And uh, they opened up a second studio over by me and told me that their walls were bare. And I was like, well, I can't allow that. Oh, speaking of bare walls, do you want to see what I got sent in the mail recently? Yes, please. Well, someone got a guy ages in print. Yeah, I wasn't even expecting it too. I opened the door yesterday and it was sitting out there and Damn I was like, oh, dude. that just made my day. Look at that. Yeah, that's awesome. That is unreal, dude. Yeah. That's that's insane. That's beautiful. That's going to go on the wall right there. Hell yeah, dude. That's And those are not, you know, very readily available either. Yeah, yeah. Like to get a print that size, and that's on canvas too, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. To get one of his large scale canvas prints is not, that's that's a pretty rare thing. I know. It's not didn't. very common. I, I was most surprised because I just wasn't even expecting it. So I got to get it stretched and framed or whatever to hang up. Yeah, I wouldn't even stretch it. I would just, I would frame it. I would throw um, a mat around it, mm -hmm. take it to Michael's or something, get a mat cut for it, and then um, throw it in a frame. Okay. Get like a two inch mat. Uh, you'll probably have to get a, a custom frame made for it. Right. But, you know, throw a two, two inch mat around it, man, and, you know, display that with pride because that uh, is, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, if, if we're showing off, I, I mean, I've had this for a little bit, but if we're showing off artwork, I, I could show off some artwork. Yeah, show it off. What you got? Uh, let's now, see. Now's your moment to brag. Uh, <clears throat> original Guy Aitchison oil painting. Ooh, doggy. Uh, yeah. He was doing a series of um, small oil paintings last September and um, selling them for a pretty reasonable price. Oh, yes, and, I um, remember those. Yeah, so I picked one up and um, yeah, it's now, it's now hanging up next to a couple other originals I have. I've got a collection of artwork that still has yet to be framed. Um, but that's also because like a lot of it's very... Um, well, it's original, but it's also light sensitive. Some of it's like marker drawings. Some of it is watercolors. Um, but I'm, I'm a huge advocate for supporting other artists in their original artwork, especially if it's done by hand. I really try to support other artists as much as I can. So... If that means, you know, purchasing a color study from someone that is trying to make a little bit of extra money for the holidays and I can afford to do it, I'll do it. Um, you know, especially if it's something for like that and 
I've got the funds available at the time, then yeah, I'll go through, I'll pick up a couple of color studies. They might not get framed for a few years, but I'll pick them up. Yeah. You know, like I picked up um, a few years back, Chris Dunn was selling a couple of uh, color studies of peonies that he had done. And um, I picked those up for like, I think it was like 300, but it was two of them. One was um, red and pink and the other one was blues on like a stained background. And he was selling both of them for like 300 bucks. And I was like, uh, yeah, yes, no, those are mine. Like, here's money. Give them to me. <laughs> yeah. um, and he's like, yeah, they're just color studies. They're pretty rough. And I'm like, these things are gorgeous. What are you talking about? So I've got that. I've got a couple of Dave Tevenaugh originals. Um, one's framed. Two or three of them aren't. Uh, I've got a couple of um, really nice, like, signed prints from Dean Sacred out of uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Um, you know, I, I, I collect art. I collect prints. I collect, you know, mementos of places that I've been and people I've seen. Um, it's not an original work of art, but I do have one of the first few copies of the Philippe Lou Dragon Claw book um, that was personally signed by him at the London show back in 2017. Nice. Um, you know, just different, different fun collectible things that are nostalgic for me. Yeah, I get that. I've got that with um, lanyards and passes right now from shows and um, gatherings and whatnot. Oh, dude, I'm telling you right now, man, if you do what I did, and I was collecting them for quite a few years, if you do what I did and you really hold on to them, your collection is going to be so huge in 10 years, you're going to be like, I got to start getting rid of some of these. Yeah, right now they're hanging in my car, so they're going to have to come down soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think at one point in time, I had like 30 some odd different passes, um, you know, all just hanging up at the studio, like all on one lanyard. And it, people used to look at it and be like, what is that? It's like, oh, those are all the uh, the show passes that I've gotten over the years for, you know, different conventions I've been at and worked at. And they're like, oh. Like, yeah, it's nostalgic, but like some are international, some are local, um, some are cool, some were like bad memories, but, you know, it happens. Yeah. Um, I just got invited out actually to a show in Paris uh, from my friend Clement, who is in Malaysia. Um. He's actually coming out to work the Puerto Rico tattoo convention with me, which is nice. going to be amazing. And by the way, any of you out there that uh, are interested, highly recommend attending the Puerto Rico tattoo convention. It is an absolutely top caliber artist show. Uh, it's kind of hard to get into, but once you're in, you're in. And it is a great time being able to go and talk to all of these other artists, do, you know, practice what you do and do some awesome tattoos. And it's usually held in December when it gets to be super cold. So it's like, yeah, cold months, tropical Island. I'll go. Yeah. I remember hearing you talk a bit about it last week. It's, it's not a very big show. Um, there's not, I, I don't think there's anything more than like maybe 150 artists that work at it tops. Mm -hmm. And that's at the absolute max. I, I honestly think they try to keep it to a hundred or less, but I could be off on my count. Um, very small show, but very high caliber artists. Uh, Russ Abbott was there a couple of years ago. Um, guys from all over the world too. James Tex is going to be there this year with his son, Anthony. Uh, Victor Chill was there one year. Uh, just a whole bunch. Dave Tevenall was there. Uh, Calais Corson. 
whole bunch of guys, Jay Marceau, um, you know, really, really world-class artists that show up to work at it. Um, a lot of it is a way to network. Um, it's not usually that big as far as like attendance goes, but you get a lot of people that show up to work at the show that do very similar styles. And I was pointing this out to someone the other night. And I was mentioning some of the names that were going to be up at the deadly show. And she's like, how do you think they pick who works these shows? And I was like, it's actually pretty easy to figure that out. I said, scroll through the page, their Instagram page, and start looking at similarities in work. You know, just look at what they have advertised for these artists. When you start to notice similarities in work, you see people that naturally gravitate towards each other. So those are going to be the people that are most likely to work at a specific show. You know, um, look at different conventions uh, around California, right? Southern California, um, even as far as like San Francisco. Um, you've got a lot of people out in the West Coast that do a lot of fine line work. A lot of realism, a lot of black and gray stuff, a lot of color realism. Um, you start to move towards the Midwest and you see a lot more abstract like biomech guys. Uh, you start to move, and I'm not saying there's not a lot of photorealism artists in the Midwest. All I'm saying is you can start to see a trend where certain styles tend to be more popular in certain areas. Um, go to New York City. You'll start to see a lot more like almost traditional, not quite, but almost traditional Japanese style tattoos. Um, you'll start to see a lot more illustrative stuff. And I'm not, once again, I'm not saying that, you know, that's all that there is there because in New York City, you have so many different artists doing so many different things. It's ridiculous. But you start to notice trends in certain locations around the world. Um. So when you see a whole bunch of, say, Canadian artists that are getting together, <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. well, I know that if it's a whole bunch yeah. of Canadian artists that are really well known, they're going to be doing a lot of illustrative yeah. stuff. And if that's the kind of stuff I like, that's where I'm going to go to a show. Until you get to shows like London yeah, right. that are it. just it's, insane, it's, where they have the best of the best in every <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of uh, traditional um, tattooing going on up here in the Boston area. Yeah, um, sure. New England it is very uh, known for its traditional work. A handful of guys that that do um, like that, you know, realistic type stuff. Um, but that's that's about it. I mean, yeah, Evan Evan Olin um, down in Rhode Island, and um, I have uh, Jesse Ricks, you know, doing his thing. Timmy. Um, Tim, yeah, I mean, but even then, like Tim and and um, and and Tony and, and guys like that, like it's a little more illustrative, right? Like it's right, it's brightly colored. I mean, Tim does realistic stuff, but it definitely has like that illustrative quality to it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So there's like there's handfuls of that, and then everything else, you know, it's like heavy on the the traditional style up here for sure. Yeah, you can see a lot of that also down in Austin, Texas. Um, you see a lot of very traditionally based artists, a lot of very heavy single line weight, uh, very simplistic coloring and shading in a lot of their uh, tattoos, a lot of more traditional um, kind of motifs. Um, but you're right, New England is very well known for its traditional scene. I cannot argue with that one bit. Um, Philadelphia also has a very strong traditional scene, but we also have a lot of very heavy people that do a lot of um, like horror portraits. There's a lot of color realism. Um, you get people all over the state doing different stuff, but that's with every state. So I can't really say that that's unique. Um, but, you know, there's different people in different places doing different things. Uh, but you can, if you really start to look at geographic locations and styles that are prominent, 
you can really start to pick up on trends in different types of areas. I always found that to be very interesting. But yeah, I got uh, invited out to a show in Paris, even though the Paris tattoo convention, Mundal Tattooage, uh, is no longer a thing. Um, apparently, this show is apparently starting to replace it. Um, don't know if it's run by the same people or not. I believe it is. But I was invited out to that by my friend Clement in November. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go this year, but I will be there next year. 100% uh, for sure, because I love France and I love that show. Um, and just to be able to go back again is like awesome. Um, you know, heaven forbid, let's, you know, pray that there's no kind of a major outbreak of anything else, but um, I would like to make it back to that one. I would also like to make it out to um, a couple other places in like Southeast Asia, uh, maybe the I Love Tattoo Convention in Taiwan, that would be amazing. But, you know, just trying to travel more, see more of the world, uh, make a little bit of money while I'm doing it. I think that would be an absolutely stellar time. This is a heel tattoo um, on another wow. one here. This was a cover up. Um, and uh, we were able to put it in, un underneath, uh, underneath one of the leaves here. I think it's underneath of this one right here. Where? Uh, using the yeah, right, right, right. It, but exactly it fits in between all those little water droplets so we use the water that's droplets. not a cover-up <laughs> the water droplets to help you know uh steer direction away from where everything's happening but this is about a month or so old uh, yeah it's like april 15th or something yeah, yeah so april know. 15th all all that's healed phenomenal. up phenomenal oh yeah, that's beautiful i love those water drops too yeah, yeah, I, yeah it's drops. effective for cover-ups man you can sneak them into those little negative areas you know what i mean especially when you're doing floral stuff. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, bravo, yeah. man. But needless to say, if anyone ever feels like traveling, hit me up and let me know. I'm always looking for travel buddies. So I know, Seth, you said you wanted to travel, but like, I really don't know what's up in Nome, Alaska that you want to go see. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely want to travel. Um, I, there are so many places, but that is definitely not one of them. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, and this I, have, is... I have family in London. You know, I, I would love to get over there and, and visit with them and, and, you know, do a guest spot over there or do, do check out the convention. And, um, Canada is definitely a bucket list for me. Um, I've only been out of the country twice. I, I have not traveled enough uh, for tattooing. I've done a little bit of traveling, but not nearly enough for tattooing. Most of the people that I've been fortunate enough to meet have been between Massachusetts and Philadelphia um, and Maryland. Um, and it's all like through conventions and stuff like that. I, I took a quick trip out to the West coast and, uh, and, and stayed in San Francisco for a couple of days. And, you know, I stopped at a shop driving through Ukiah. Uh, I met a guy there. Um, it's a pretty well-known shop there. And then down in, um, in San Francisco, I, I went and visited uh, Juan uh, Puente at uh, Blackheart. It was actually, I was going to see uh, uh, Scott, uh, Sylvia. Um, he does guest spots at, at, he and Jason Goldberg are friends. So he, he does guest spots there all the time. And so Jason's like, you got to stop by Blackheart and check it out while you're there. Um, I definitely did, uh, but missed Scott and ended up seeing, uh, seeing Juan, who I had not seen in years since I first started tattooing. And he is, I mean, uh, such a nice guy and so talented. And um, it was awesome. And, you know, it was, it, it, we go back to like, talking about those experiences, right? Like how, even if you're not working, just having conversations with these people can influence you or can inspire you and, they, they just um, make you feel like you're more part of the community and you want to try harder and you know what I mean? And to, to get better. And they, they definitely help feed that part, I think of the, uh, of the process. Um, 
it was wild. I got to see, uh, they had one of, uh, they had the, the original sign for, for uh, 222 tattoo in the back. And I was just, he's like, Hey, if you want to look around the shop, you can look around. I was like, Oh, thanks, man. So I'm looking around, checking everything out. And I'm like, dude, is this what I think it is? Like, he's like, yeah. I was like, Oh my God, I regret not getting a picture holding it. Um, but I'll make my way back out there to, uh, to see that for sure. And, and, and get the obligatory picture holding the sign. Um, and uh, who else did I say? Oh, I went to uh, uh, Bill Salmon's shop there. Uh, I forget the name of it in San Francisco. Um, and met a met a, a really nice artist who was there. Bill was not there uh, when I was there, but um, it was uh, it was pretty wild, man. And just just popping into those shops really uh, it it does a lot for I think at least for me speaking from my experience. Not even tattooing there, just just popping in and seeing them. It's like you're having these moments where you're 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 crossing through tattoo history and and becoming part of the we'll call it like the family tree. You know, it's pretty awesome. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think you touched on a very awesome point there. And that's uh, the whole as- circling back to what we first started talking about today was the whole aspect of community and how being part of a community as a whole can be an absolutely incredible experience and help take you to a completely different level than where you could ever imagine yourself to be. Um, I agree. Yeah. You know, and that's why I, I try to stay active in as many different communities as I possibly can, because I'm always looking to meet other people, gain more knowledge. Um, you know, maybe someone out there has a tip for me that I've never heard of, you know, that could completely change my tattoo career. You never know. Um, so I'm constantly out there looking to meet new people, talk to new people. That's why I always have an open invitation. If anyone ever wants to join in on these drawing groups, send me a message. Let me know. Tell me how I can reach out to you. I'll send you the link. Feel free to jump in, um, you know, and join the discussions, you know, share the knowledge, share what you've learned over life. There's a pretty good chance that if you're joining in, I'm pretty sure we're not going to work near each other. So it's like, what do you have to lose? You know, if you're worried about people stealing your magic and stealing your business, well, guess what? If we don't work near each other, why does it matter? Well, even so, I mean, there's no, it goes back to that, you know, sharing. When you share knowledge with somebody, you know, um, it, it, uh, it reinforces that education to ourselves, right? Like we're, we're, we're only reinforcing the things that we know, like by teaching other people, we become better at the things that we do. Um, and, and then you start having those conversations and you're right, Jason, you never know where they're going to go or what you're going to learn from whom. Um, but it's important to have them and it's important to not steer yourself away from those moments. Uh, especially in this business, you know, where, where there's, there's still so much knowledge to be had from so many different people. And even guys that are and girls that are just getting started in the business that are, you know, like you said, you never know where you're going to, where you're going to find uh, inspiration or knowledge, you know? Yeah. And uh, so Adam just made a comment in the, uh, the YouTube chat. Um, He said, I'm, I'm really, really lucky. Um, You know, and he also said he'd like to meet Ad Pancho. um, Oh yeah. You know, I think there are a lot of people out there that would like to meet him. So yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, yeah. Part of, uh, part of what I do and the way that I've done it and the reason why I've been so fortunate, I I don't even say lucky because, you know, luck doesn't really have too much to do with it. Um, part of the reason why I've been very fortunate is because I invest, you know, I want to meet these people. So I'm going to book an appointment and fly out and get tattooed by, you know, I want to meet uh chris dunn from deadly tattoos and james tex and anthony tex i'm gonna find out what shows they're going to and i'm gonna book an appointment with them and i'm gonna go and i'm gonna talk their ear off the entire time i'm gonna ask them every question i can think of you know i was out getting tattooed by guy and you know what i asked him every question i could conceivably think of 
I saw some of those. Um, I was organizing the backlog of videos the other day and I would, uh, saw some of the videos that you put up there from that. Yeah, that was that was a very, very educational trip. And I'd love to make another trip out there and get another piece done by him. I'm just starting to run out of a lot of room and uh, don't really know what else I would get done. But I'm sure I could come up with something. Or you can always do it with someone. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to get out there and just like film him tattooing. Um, you know, even if I wasn't the one getting tattooed, you know, I'd love to head out there, make the trip and, um, you know, with someone else and just film him doing a tattoo, ask him some more questions, catch up with him some more, pick his brain about a few, few additional things. Um, and just, you know, hang out, you know, hang out, sketch, draw, talk philosophy of art, talk, whatever. Those are uh, some of the, you know, I've been fortunate that a lot of the people that I've been around in this business um, have been very, very talented and I've learned so much from all of them. And a lot of the experiences that informed me as an artist came from exactly what you're, you're talking about, just sitting there, not even necessarily watching them tattoo, just sitting down with a sketchbook across from each other and drinking some coffee and drawing, you know, yeah. spending it some painting and just kind of talking art and talking business and gain so much from doing that you know uh, oh without question well, that's one thing I, so i'm a huge advocate of just attending tattoo conventions i don't even yeah. like to work at them all the time i just like to go to them and just walk around find someone whose work is incredible and just yeah. ask them if i can sit and talk to them yeah or like, yeah, hey, did, when you I get done this, Hell if you City have a break. Like so much. Exactly. You know, it, it's an absolutely incredible thing to just sit down and pick people's brains. Kyle, how long you have know? you been tattooing? Um, I haven't started yet. I actually just moved out here. I'm in Columbus now, um, Ohio. I moved out here like a awesome. week and a half ago to get everything started up. Awesome. Yeah. Good luck with everything. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. But you know, even, even without going through an apprenticeship yet, I still got some basic understanding of some concepts. So I was still able to have that conversation with a bunch of artists, which was very nice. Helped me really feel a part of the community. Yeah, man. Well, you are part of the community. Show effort, you know, and people are more than willing to help. Yeah. Kyle, don't ever think you're not part of the community. You are, you definitely are. And you're well on your way, man. Yeah, I know by this point, I, it's, it's, you know, like when I went to Hell City, I was like, oh, hey, cool. It finally feels real now. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, man. It's, um, and Hell City is one of those conventions that Hell City in the U.S. is kind of like the London convention in Europe, where you have a lot of top tier artists that are there that you can very easily converse with. Yeah. You know, I don't know if they're, I mean, correct. The London convention is no longer a thing, which sucks. Um, it's a shame, but I understand why Mickey Violenti is no longer doing it and it sucks, but it's, it is what it is. Um, but that to me was always like the world cup of tattooing, right? There were a ton of us based artists. There were a ton of artists from Denmark and the Netherlands, Sweden, Scotland, uh, Malaysia, Japan, China, and they were would all converge in London for this show. You know, all over the world, man. And but the closest thing we have left to something like that is the Hell City show, um, where you have a lot of artists out there. Granted, some of them, uh, Hell City does, in my opinion, tend to be a bit more of like a a domestic show, if that's the appropriate term. Right, you have right, a lot I more US-based artists. But in the past, it has been a very big international show. Andre Malcolm is uh, 100% on my list of people to get tattooed by. I really wanted him to do, I want to get a back piece and it's partial cover-up. But um, just, uh, you know, hope, I'm hoping over the next few years, maybe I'll be able to take the time to travel out there and get that stuff done. 
Absolutely. And he's a super nice guy too. Um, we actually had him on reinventing the tattoo a couple of times doing different seminars. Uh, he's got a whole koi fish seminar that you can purchase. I believe that's for sale on reinventing the tattoo, but he did a, um, as a member of reinventing the tattoo, and I don't know exactly where it is, but there used to be a replay. He did a two day seminar on drawing Japanese waves and his method for drawing Japanese waves and looking at and watching his process is mesmerizing how he starts so incredibly small with his thumbnails. I mean, we're talking like an inch by two inches, maybe tiny, tiny, itty bitty thumbnails. That's what we talked about before is, you know, when you're doing back pieces and sleeves and stuff like that, if you can work out the positive and negative relationships of things on a small scale and it works, you know, then you blow it up. It's only going to look that much better. Yeah. It's going to be that much more bold. Um, even if you have to crop the design, you know, draw small, blow it up. And there you go. Now it's simplified enough that you're going to be able to see what it is from across the street. And especially if you're working large scale, that's what you have to do. If you really want that design to be legible over time. Cool. Well, we are about out of time for today. Um, I'm going to go through and we can do a couple of real quick sign offs because um, I have to get outside and mow the lawn because that's part of being a tattooer. You have to take care of everyday stuff as well. So I'm going to switch this over. Cool. And uh, Kyle, we'll start with you because it looks like Seth is talking to someone. Yeah. You can find me online, skiesoffiretattoo.com, skiesoffiretattoo. And also now on um, Thursday evenings, I'm going to be helping doing the Tattoo Collecting 101 podcast as well. So check that out too. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And that's um, Thursday evenings. I thought that was on Fridays for some reason. Thursday. Yeah, Thursdays. Is 6 it? p.m. Okay. EST. Awesome. Awesome. So be sure to tune in. That's going to be yeah. amazing, man. Yeah, it'll be very um, fun. And I think we're waiting on Seth to get back. Uh, Seth, I'm going to spotlight you. Go ahead and we give us a off. quick sign off. No problem, man. Uh, my name is Seth Mushrush. You can uh, find me at the Gallery Tattoo Studio in Concord, Massachusetts, and um, the rest of the time at uh, Baker Street Tattoo in Media, PA, uh, right outside of Philadelphia. The website, uh, sethmushrushart.com. I have paintings and prints and tattoos and things of that nature up there. And then on Instagram, uh, at Seth Mushrush. Give me a follow. And um, yeah, thank you very much for having me on, man. I appreciate it. I always look forward to these. Likewise, likewise. Um, and I'm going to, there we go. Um, so actually, let's do this. So thanks very much, everyone, for, uh, for joining us today on the Skill Building Sunday Drawing Group here at Reinventing the Tattoo. Um, it's, about, it's just about 3 p.m. Uh, on Sunday, May 29th. So thank you very much for watching. And if you like the content on today's show, make sure to tell all of the people that you know that like tattoos or do tattoos about the show. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Um, you know, that way we know we're doing our jobs right. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. And we will see you again uh, next Sunday. We will be doing live convention coverage from the Deadly Tattoo Convention. I think we're also trying to work that out for Friday as well. Um, stay tuned on updates for next Sunday's drawing group as that might not happen, question mark, maybe. Um, but that all kind of depends because I'm getting tattooed all day Saturday and I don't know if I'm going to feel up for it. So uh, without further ado, thank you very much. Uh, Kyle, Seth, thank you guys for joining in today. And uh, 